To wish each other Merry Christmas is almost a mockery. Of such is the prevailing gloom. Our troubles appear to obtrude themselves upon us more acutely today than at any other time. We recall our fondest hope and belief last year that this Christmas we should eat our dinner in peace. For Germany too, 1916 was closing in gloom. For the first time since 1914, her armies had won few resounding victories for the fatherland to celebrate. Germany had suffered nearly a million and a half casualties in one year, fighting against growing odds in the West, in the Balkans, and in the East. Once again, that summer, her brittle ally, Austria, had broken before a Russian onslaught. The worst crisis that the Eastern Front had ever known now began. For this time, there was no victorious German army standing by ready to save. On August the 27th, Romania declared war and opened yet another hostile front against the Central Powers. Germany's enemies had at last thrown their full weight against her with simultaneous violence. The autumn of 1916 witnessed the most gigantic struggle in the history of the world. Nearly 14 million Allied soldiers against the 9 millions of Germany and her allies. The German army held on everywhere, but it was profoundly shaken. As early as September, the Germans had begun to build a new line of defences far behind their front on the Somme, deeper and more powerful than before, the Hindenburg Line. Hindenburg told his officers, we must save the men from a second Somme battle. In Germany herself, people faced the winter's bitter cold without fuel to warm the home and with little expectation to warm their hearts. The British blockade was doing its deadly work. Workers in the factories and children in the schools lived on turnips, black bread and substitute foods. Hindenburg wrote, There was no doubt that people at home had been bitterly disappointed by the military events of the last few months. I regarded the country's morale as serious, though it had not collapsed. Victory seemed a long way away from Germany now. In Austria, the dream had well nigh vanished. On the 21st of November, the Emperor Franz Josef died. And Habsburg pomp and pride seemed to be buried with him. Now his whole empire lay slowly dying, victim of the monstrous violence it had done so much to provoke. Its polyglot population, Austrian, Hungarian or Slav, yearned for food, for warmth, for war to cease. With the venerable white-haired emperor, a large part of the national consciousness of the conglomerate empire sank forever into the grave. Austrian political leaders made no secret that she could not stand any further burdens in the way of military and political failures. The new Emperor Karl saw no salvation for his empire or for the House of Habsburg in a continuation of the long-drawn agony of the war. Like his peoples, he yearned for an end to empty victories and bloody defeats. In Ludendorff's words, he wanted peace.
The Russian Empire too was dying. A dynasty that had ruled for 300 years was collapsing like a ruined monument under the blows of modern war. The last hopes, the last energies of the loyal soldiers and brave officers of Holy Russia had been poured into Gruzilov's summer offensive. Great advances, great booty, huge casualties. And at the end, another hollow victory. Since 1914, Russia had lost over four and a half million men killed or wounded, and another two million as prisoners. Misery and discontent stalked the endless vistas of the Russian homeland. In December, an observer wrote to Lloyd George, the next three months are the critical period. Either the government will yield, or there will be a revolution. Or Russia will have to stop fighting and make peace. In France, the dying year brought the same bleak tally. One in every six of the French adult population had passed into the armed forces. One in every 25 of the entire French race was now dead or wounded or missing. Verdun had been the only French victory of 1916, and this victory had taken 10 months to produce, at a cost which everyone understood to be immense. A French soldier wrote, what kind of nation will they make of us tomorrow? These exhausted creatures, emptied of blood, emptied of thought, crushed by superhuman fatigue. After two years of war, France was calling up boys of 17, and still the invader squatted immovably on her soil. How long could she fight on? The war can last a year longer if our forces melt away at the same rate as in the preceding months. France may emerge victorious from the struggle, but she will be exhausted and condemned to become a nation of second rank. Neither of the contending parties knew the exaltation of victory. To all of Europe, the price of elusive victory was proving higher and higher. Small wonder that men's minds turned to fresh concepts. In Germany, the Imperial Chancellor, Bettmann Hollweg, saw peace negotiations as the only way out of the European catastrophe. After two years of war, without any real prospect of an end, I felt that this step was politically necessary. On the 6th of December, the Germans captured Bucharest, capital of Romania. And this solitary victory gave Bettmann Holweg the springboard he needed. As the German troops marched in, he sent a note to the American government. Prompted by the desire to avoid further bloodshed and to make an end of the atrocities of war, Germany, Austria, Bulgaria and Turkey have proposed to enter forthwith into peace negotiations. If in spite of this offer of peace and reconciliation, the struggle should go on, Germany and her allies are resolved to continue it until a victorious end, but they solemnly decline every responsibility for this before humanity and history. Now both the American president, Woodrow Wilson, and the Pope intervened to ask the warring nations to state their peace terms. Reactions were mixed. In Britain, there were a few newspapers which argued a summary rejection without reasons of the German offer by the Allies is out of the question. But other papers demanded war until Germany was utterly smashed. The question is the mastery between two wholly incompatible views of right or wrong, of humanity, of civilization and of law. It does